Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. It's Sunday, August 21st, 2022. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. And welcome to Cubs Out Loud, the bear podcast of Indeterminate Length, episode number 661. And there we go with the perfect intro, which I haven't done in a while. And we also have... Edward Angelini Cook right below me. Yay. Doctor Edward Angelini Cook. I didn't say that, but I will. The doctor is in the house. Mm -hmm. Which you know what that means. Oh, it's time for another one of those episodes. Gary, what are we talking about specifically? Oh, for a moment, I thought we were going to talk about getting a proctology exam. Anyways, um... Not that kind of doctor. He's not that kind of doctor. I mean, I'm sure he would have to perform it in a non like medical <laughs> capacity. He has a <laughs> side. He has a side. It's good to have that Andy. Was that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Anyways. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, Dr. Angelini Cook is back in the house as a resident sex therapist. Uh, it's been a moment. Six forty nine was the last time you were here. Landscape of relationships is mm. this lovely ongoing series that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and this time we're going to talk about QPRs. Mm -hmm. What's Look, I'm not ready for a test today. I don't want to take my QPR right now. So a QPR is a queer platonic relationship. Oh, it's mm. yes. So that's gonna be that's that's some word unpacking. Pack, packing. <laughs> wow, the law. Yeah, um, Gary, what what is a QPR? Um, so they're usually a committed relationship that is neither romantic nor sexual in nature and differs from a close friendship by having the same structure and status as a romantic relationship. <laughs> this is actual dictionary with Gary. <laughs> yes. Not, our, not our urban dictionary, that old relic. Um, so yeah, like uh so it's like the in-between level. So like if you have friendships and then you have like intimate love relationships, this is like the the middle ground. Uh -huh. sound... almost like queering uh what it means to be in a relationship. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um so so and uh... no, go ahead. Oh, um, and uh, so this, I guess, you know, this term um, has begun to, uh, or it, like it has its origins in asexual and aromantic communities um, within the um, LGBTQIA uh, plus communities, um, but it's also um, been expanding into polyamorous um, relationships uh, and communities in order to describe the complex nature of their relationships. Hmm. And I think the other, yeah, the, the other thing to, that's important to, to note with this is that, you know, when you would describe this as somebody who may 
you know, this may not be something that they would want. If you say, oh, I'm in a queer platonic relationship and you give a definition, they're like, so you have a best friend. <laughs> oh, so we're going to go there. Okay. And you're like, kind of. Oh. Yes, but not really. And no, not really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that a lot of people have reactions to this. Well, I, I find it interesting because part of the definition is that it's not a friendship and it's not a romantic relationship. And mm-hmm. I think that it might confuse people because for most individuals, I think that's what they would think they have. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Or they or they have blood relatives, which is a whole other thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this really this really goes to, you know, like the why it's called the landscape of relationships and why usually when we have these uh, topics, I like to say that, you know, um, there are so many different kinds of relationships um, that like, you know, we're not just talking about romantic relationships. We're yeah. also work relationships, family relationships friend relationships, your relationships with your mailman or mail person, mm-hmm. your relationships with, you know, whoever, the person just walking down the street. Um, Stranger. And yeah, that's another word for them. Um, and it's, you know, it's, I think, you know, I think it also talks about like uh, the two words that are really important here are commitment and intimacy. Yeah. Um, which which are really important for this relationship structure. Yeah. So for the lay person, <laughs> what's the most equivalent thing they could understand as a QPR? Um well. I mean, I think that like, you know, basically it is it's just basically. Yeah. I don't. I don't know the. <laughs> I don't know the best way to answer that question to the a lay person. Um, it's just somebody that you have a really close relationship, but it's not sexual or romantic in nature. Um, but yeah. you still have a commitment to each other, whether that is through like cohabitation or you know sometimes family building or um, you know like financially. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like basically like interesting. Well, because I was thinking about how recently I got reacquainted with my former roommate of seven and a half years. Mm-hmm. And I guess in one viewpoint, you could say that we were in a QPR. However, I would have never thought of it that way. I would have said that we're friends mm-hmm. that live together. And it's their house and I pay the rent. <laughs> like, so like they are my landlord and they are my roommate and they are my friend. Like, you know, I'd like, like, I guess it was multi-layered. I never thought of it, but I, I could see from a certain point of view, you could say that and be like, well, you know, were you intimate? No. Were you sexual? No. Like, you know, so yeah. Well, I think the thing with that is uh, it would have to be defined within the, relationship that this is what we have right like you know it's totally Mm -hmm. fine for two people to be roommates and um to just be friends who live together right like Mm -hmm. but if um i think that when we when we talk about like having like a committed intimate um relation that is neither romantic or sexual in nature sometimes we want to talk about um like what are the goals here like what are we moving towards right so like you know just being at camp right and i'm not here to put labels on anybody um at uh at camper or anything but i know that there are some people there who sh- who like have a permanent site together but they're not in a relationship um mm-hmm. so i'm like i feel like that would be an example of a qpr right like you have something that you're both financially invested into um that you're like you know designing yourself you're making it special for the both of you right but you're not together like are you're um you're this this isn't romantic or sexual Sexual. in nature yeah but there's something that you're working towards so i guess in this context say it was like a campsite Ooh, i actually like that example that's a really good one thank you gary 
<laughs> well, no, like I, I, the reason I asked the question is I wasn't sure if there was a, a common like example or reference point that people yeah. could understand or if it doesn't fall within that. Like it is it is outside of that. And that would be why people aren't familiar with queer mm -hmm. platonic relationships in general, because they haven't had examples of them in their lives and they wouldn't necessarily see them often. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can see where, you know, um, I mean, I feel this way. I, I know people all across the spectrum. I know people that are pan, people that are bi, people that are um, gay, lesbian, queer, um, aloe, asexual. Like, I, I know a lot of different things. And that's all mostly about orientation. Um, and when you talk about, like, gender identity, like, I think of this when people talk about, oh, well, you know, they don't know anybody who's trans. And there's a part of me that's like, well, maybe you do, but you don't know you do because this isn't something that yeah. they wear as a label necessarily mm -hmm. when they introduce themselves right. um, in that yeah. way. So I think that the parallel I'm trying to make is that you may have you may have QPRs around you. You just don't know what they are. You're not mm -hmm. necessarily aware of them because yeah, you don't you necessarily may... see them or. You know, you may know what's running around. They don't have a banner. They don't have a shirt. They don't have yeah. a sign. They don't have a Actually, hat. there is a um, there is a QPR um, pride flag. Do you have a flag? But of course, <laughs> there there is a QPR pride flag. That's rather interesting. Uh -huh. I just think it's, it's um, um, yeah. I'll let you look. It wouldn't be queer if they didn't have a flag. <laughs> We were sitting here talking Aww. about how we might be in something and we don't know about it, but we've got yeah. a flag. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I also think that this um, this oh. will lead into the um, the discussion that we're going to have a little bit about amenonormativity, um, and that that I think that it's perfectly okay for two people to not. Um, be in a romantic relationship in order for them to find fulfillment in life. Mm -hmm. um, and I really appreciate that, um, that discourse, which we will talk about. Um, so thank you for sharing the link to the flag. I'm going to add it to the doc. Um, oh, cool. So what I find interesting is uh Well, first of all, I didn't know there was a flag, and I've never seen this flag before. So um, for those that are listening, um, it is white, gray, black, pink, and yellow. Mm -hmm. All but the yellow are stripes. So you have one, two, three, four, seven stripes. The top and the bottom are pink. Then the next closest are black. The next closest are gray. And the very middle is white. And then there's a yellow heart over the middle. And of all the flags I've ever seen... And I've seen a lot of them at Pride events. I've never seen this one. I have not seen this one either. Well, if you look like halfway down the page is an alternative design, um, mm -hmm. which does not have the heart. It has the um, the yellow on top of the green, the uh, pink, right. white, gray, and black. Um, but yeah, I don't think I have seen this either. So... Uh, what I find interesting in, in the description is um, long-term committed platonic relationship, which exceeds the general understanding of a traditional friendship as such. It isn't based on romance, but consults on the same or even stronger emotional commitment. The involved people may have a deep emotional connection, but may, uh, sorry, may consider spending their future together. and may even plan on raising a child together. Now, this is interesting to me because this sounds a lot like when I was in my 20s and I made a pact with my best friend at the time that right. if we were all single when we were 40, we were going to move in together and probably just marry each other. So you I was going to have – so my lesbian best friend and I, I was going to have a beard. Well, we would have be each other's beard. And that was just how it was going to be because we were like – it was the 90s. And we thought we were going to die of AIDS. Well, I thought I was going to die of AIDS because I was gay. Or, like, I just was never going to be happy. And I was going to be a hermit. Mm -hmm. And I was going to be alone mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. So, yeah. And isn't that interesting? That, like, that is the, that, like, that is the, on uh, the top of the mountain um, for us. Like, you know, if we're not in a relationship, um, then we're just going to die alone. 
But is it that what's like shoved down our throats by society? Right. Like to be right. fulfilled, we have to be in a relationship. We have to yeah. have an established life centered with another person. Mm-hmm. Notice I said person, not persons, because then that breaks the model. Lord help us when it comes to poly, because, you know, society does not handle that. Ooh, child. Not, Ooh, well, modern, child. Soci- modern society doesn't. Pre- yeah. Previous societies did. Like I think of indigenous cultures. They had absolutely no issue with you know, relationships of multiple kinds because mm-hmm. they collaboratively work together as a community for the betterment of the entire community as well as the individuals involved. Um, mm-hmm. And may or may not so, have had had religious religion shoving down uh, uh, pair relationships only. Right. Well, and to be fair, I would say, and I'm no expert on this, I might be speaking out of turn, most indigenous cultures probably are not monotheistic. And ergo, like, poly is just a natural Mm -hmm. concept to them in terms of, like, existence. Um, So, yeah, like, it, it, it... it's interesting how and you pointed out, you know, but I'm like, well, yeah, because that's that's what it was. I mean, I was born in the 70s. You were going to, you know, be married and you were going to have like, you know, 2.3 2. kids. kids. And like, mm-hmm. yeah, all that. Crap. I didn't have a half a kid. I don't know. But whatever. <laughs> like, that, that was always my oh, like, statistics. Yeah, I was always that was my whole big thing because they, they would always say 2.5. And I'm like, how can you have half, half a child? Well, yeah, when you child. when you do the math of an average, it ends up being that there's there's a half it means you either you're really actually uh, having either one child or two child. But you can't. But because the math ended up being right in the middle between one and two, it was point five. Right. But if you don't understand math, math statistics and you're just a little kid, you're like. How can I have? Half? Right. You're like, which half do I get? Top, bottom, left, right, front, back. Like, how does that work? Uh, I'm versatile, so mm-hmm. I'll take both. <laughs> hey, that might sound wrong. Anyways. So um, I think the uh, the cool thing about the Okay, so like actually, like, let's kind of um, – let's, like, set the stage here, right? So we're, like, kind of throwing out some, some words. So I thought maybe it would be a good idea to kind of go over what some of the words that we're using here, right? So, like – you know, somebody who identifies as asexual, right? And that's a spectrum in and of itself um, mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, it's a sexual orientation uh, where a person doesn't experience, experiences little to no sexual attraction to anyone and or doesn't experience desire for sexual contact. Um, somebody who's aromantic or arrow um it, that's a romantic orientation, um, which describes people whose experience of romance is disconnected from no, uh, normative societal expectations, kind of like what we're talking about, commonly due to experiencing little to no romantic attraction, but also due to feeling repulsed by romance or being uninterested in romantic relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think is really interesting um, when we talk about aloe people who um, do experience um, these things. Um, So like allosexual, so this describes somebody who is not on the asexual spectrum. They can have any romantic orientation, including um, aromantic. So you can be asexual or you can be allosexual, um, but also aromantic. Um, And the same is true for alloromantic. So you can be alloromantic, but be... um, a romantic. Wait, you so can be asexual. wait, you can be allo romantic but asexual. Okay. I was gonna say, I think we're gonna need to go over this again because you just flew through those. <laughs> I think for most of them are like listening or trying to understand mm-hmm. these four definitions that we put out there. They'll also be on the doc or on the very website. true, very true. Um, and just so that our audience knows, um, I have a tentative guest lined up for later, not in the near future, probably later on, either the end of this year or the beginning of next year, um, who is about to be an author. Who? Oh, Cody? Asexual. Yes! Yay! <laughs> That's all excited. Awesome. He knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. I love Cody. Have you met Cody? I have not. We've We've talked before. I've never met him. I haven't met him yet. I was going to um, see if he wanted to speak for my class, but um, uh, my class is going in another direction. Ah, okay. Well, he, I reached out to, to, to 
them and they uh, affirmed interest. However, I know that they just moved um, mm-hmm. their entire life m- across s- multiple states. So I was like, I will, I will get with give, you later. <laughs> right. I will give you space and time to get that all sorted out before I <laughs> pass yeah, with, um... with being an interviewed or on the show. Yes. Yeah, I, I send all of my people Cody's way. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's it's rather yes. interesting as I'm kind of like, you know, going through these definitions and trying to just, I'm trying to like put um, the queer platonic relationship in some kind of framework. Um, and as we've kind of were mentioning earlier, I'm I'm putting it like, in that middle ground area between like friendships and like romantic relationships, there's a little, like an area, we all know that there's spectrums and things, but there's like that area where it's more than a friendship, but not a romance. And that's kind of, yeah. Yeah. And I would say instead of like in between, I would mm-hmm. say off. To, I would say on this on the other side, right? Like because okay. it's not. Um, I I don't think that. Uh, you know, we talk like I don't want to like, get into like comparing like that one is better than the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think mm-hmm. that when we when we place it in like the middle there, that like again we're setting this expectation that like the romantic relationship is the goal, um, and Fair. that like it's just a roadway to. The romance so like what if we were to like just move it as another pathway from friend to um okay uh to a qpr a queer platonic relationship like a veer yeah not a veer um, i don't even like using veer because that's that means you can come back it's a like you said it's a different road it's a fork in a, it's a fork in a road where there's two paths and you can choose one or the other not that anyone it, is wrong they all kind of lead to a certain place, but they're not all leading to the same place. Yeah, and I would even argue, um, and I think that there is, um, you know, like we kind of talked about that QPRs um, exist within uh, consensual non-monogamy. Um, so, like, I think that even people who are allosexual and alloromantic can also engage within QPRs um, mm-hmm. because possibly this may be a relationship that they don't have any romantic relationship or or romantic intentions or sexual intentions with this person, but they still find them to be a very significant part of their life. And they would like to, um, like even with um, say the camp example, right? Like those two people may be allosexual or an alloromantic, um, but they, you know, have found this place that they both want to invest in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 There's, um, I can see this being, there's a, there's a, um, there's actually a guy here in town, um, who he considers himself asexual, I think aromantic as well, but he has a, um, he has a non, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember what he said, because he described it during, we were having a conversation on, since, since the whole play, since, Ooh, blah, words, sensual play or sense play. Um, and, you know, he is very much into that, but it's not in a sexual way because he does not have sexual relationships because he considers himself asexual. He has a um, uh, a pup that is, he is in a, again, non-sexual um, kink relationship with but it is not a it is not one of a sexual nature it is a one of um nurturing in a sense and guiding but it mentorship in a mentor yeah kind of in a mentorship kind of way it kind of is falling into this queer platonic relationship that i'm as you were kind of describing it um and i when he described it he during that conversation i was kind of like okay it makes sense because for me, who's been involved with the letter key community, we know about relationships like that, where it is not sexual, 
mm-hmm. there's there's some kind of give and take or some power dynamic that is being involved. But sometimes that dynamic is purely for that dynamic. It is not a getting any, sometimes not even getting any sexual pleasure from what you're doing. It is more along of that power exchange for that moment are a long-term version of that. And I also just kind of want to throw it out there when we're, when we are talking about like asexual, you know, individuals, right. That does fall in like, you know, a continuum. Right. And that like, um, you know, there are sex, uh, asexual individuals, ace individuals who do engage in sex, right. They may not desire it or, you know, have a need for it, but like, you know, um, they will. Right. And, they might be like sex positive, but there are mm-hmm. others who are sex averse or sex um, repulsed, right? Who, you know, mm-hmm. that's just not happening. Um, so, you know, and I think the same is for um, aromantic individuals that, you know, they may not find the desire to be romantic, but their, um, you know, say their partner is our romantic, right? Like, um, I can make a ro- romantic gesture, right? Um, mm-hmm. If that will serve a love language. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, so the um, the other thing that is also really interesting is that like these concepts are very uh, what. Um, uh, this uh, article that I, I found said is an ancient practice made new again. Um, so, you know, have, um, has anybody heard of like Boston marriages or romantic friendships? So I haven't heard these terms, mm-hmm. but looking over the docket, what the definitions are, um, I totally recognize them. Right. Like, yeah, like, have you ever heard the rumors that, like, Abraham Lincoln was gay or um, uh, Alexander Hamilton was gay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that comes from the, um, like, you know, historical analysis of, like, letters that they wrote between um, other males that were very uh, intense and very um, emotionally... And, you know, oftentimes intimate in nature that people saw that and were like, oh, well, then they must have been bisexual or, mm. or gay. Um, when um, a lot of same sex, uh, you know, same sex individuals, right? Um, it was like what, Damon, what you were talking about, like a mentorship mm-hmm. uh, kind of aspect, um, because that is where, like, uh, they weren't allowed to speak that way to women, right? Um, so they th- they spoke between each other that way. Um, and that is also wh- how women um, had, uh, you know, romantic friendships with others where a lot of people considered, you know, them either lesbian or, or bisexual, right? When it was a camaraderie, it was a kind of like a pen pal kind of uh, mm. nature. Um which is really interesting. And then um, there are these things called Boston marriages, um, which was where two independent women um, chose to build a life together, um, you know, for, for whatever reason. Um, and so like, these are things that have happened and there are even biblical um, and, you know, other contexts where these type of relationships existed. Um, so this isn't a new concept. I find the Boston marriage really interesting because I know a couple um, that would probably meet this definition, but everyone might raise a little bit of an eyebrow um, because it took me a moment to wrap my mind around it. They were sisters, like Mm -hmm. legitimate blood sisters, but they grew up, um, lived separately, and then later in life moved in together and just owned a house together and lived mm-hmm. their lives together. And if you didn't know they were sisters, I think a lot of people would presume that they're a lesbian couple. Mm. And, and then in today's age, um, with the same last name, they would presume they were married. True. Right. 
but knowing the, like the, the background, like when I first got introduced to them, um, I was like, I, it took me a moment because I was like, wait, so because people were talking about how they're sisters and I was like, and I'm thinking, but these are all um, hetero identifying individuals. So I'm like, wait, they don't mean sisters. I was like, I'm, wait, I'm, huh? Like, <laughs> it took me a moment to figure out what they were talking about. And then they were like, no, they're actually blood sisters. Like they have the same parents. And I was like, oh, OK, but they do like 80 percent, 90 percent of their life together. They travel together, mm -hmm. they vacation together, they live together. They, you know, go out to functions together. It, it, like they're a unit, they're a relationship, they're a couple, and yet not. Yeah. So seeing this definition, I was like, oh, yeah, I totally can see that. Just like, yeah. you know, we were talking about in, in historical context, um, there, I think there's been a number of same gender identified couples, quote unquote, or, um, you know, people that have been shipped in a modern context, like you said, Edward, you know, about how they people presume a, a sexual orientation identity to these people. And I've always been one that's like, yes, I get it. Like the younger, like gay part of myself is like, yes, like, you know, we need more representation in history. And yet another part of me is like, but I wasn't living around that. Like, I don't I don't know. No one can really right. know the truth of the time. And so while there are documents, you know, communications, things that we are establishing this off of, we really don't know like what the dynamic was. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, whether or not they were ever intimate or if it was purely cerebral, um, mm -hmm. you know, there were some emotional aspects to it, but it was never physical. Um, it, it's difficult for us as I think LGBTQIA, like, you know, a queer community to look back at history and I get it. Like, I think there is a thirst and desire for representation. We want to be seen. We want the world to understand we have been around since the ever since the like beginning of, of our species that, you know, there is nothing new about us or unique or different. And, you know, this isn't a development. It has purely always been. So we mm -hmm. seek those things out. And yet at the same time, because of multitudes of factors, all these variables, there hasn't always been documentation. Or if there was, it may have been lost to time or intentionally eradicated, making it difficult for us to find that and you know yep. be able to, to use it as as reference. I, I mean, I think about yeah. there's there's a lot of talk at times in in certain circles about with the Holocaust, like how much was lost because you know so much art, different materials, things were collected, libraries, like and then just destroyed, mm -hmm. and you know how we don't really like. And that continues to this day. There's still cultures in the world, you know, that things are being obliterated or lost or intentionally, you know, destroyed. And so it really kind of makes you question, like, in human history, what we have as record. Yep. So it's interesting that, you know, we – I like how, you know, ancient practice made new again, quote, unquote. And I'm like, eh, okay. I mean – That's one way to phrase it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Everything old is new again. <laughs> I just yeah, I did that. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So you know, I think that. Uh, but I I also kind of wonder if part of that the whole shipping um thing is again informed by that um, normativity of romantic relationships um, right. and normativity of, of sexual beings and romantic beings. Um, yeah. And uh, that again, you know, this is uh, turning that on its head and, you know, maybe, maybe doing that is we're just, you know, feeding into a um, these norms, these expectations that we have. Right. I was just thinking that like, you know, we've seen people in our lives oftentimes, or some of us have, and we see like these two people that, you know, you see them around all the time or you, you've, you've, you've seen them like always somewhere together and we want to just automatically go, well, oh, they fucking like you want to, you want to put that in their head. Like your thought is that they have to be, they have to be something intimate, either, especially even including sexual, maybe mm -hmm. romantic but we have to have that in our head or else we, it doesn't work in our minds. Well, I we think our, just, yeah. 
Right. I, I mean, I think our, you're right, Damon, that our brains automatically apply the context that we understand. Mm-hmm. So if we are a sexual being, we presume everybody is a sexual being. And while that is true, <laughs> um, the definition of that is is what people kind of forget about. Like, I mean, I think of how there's a presumption that everyone, not everyone, but um, for, well, when we were younger, there was a presumption that everybody was straight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, that was just the world that we lived in. Um, I don't know if that's quite the case now, um, given the, the things that we've seen in our decades of experience in life. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that that's just natural that we see, you know, a, a couple a relationship and then we start layering on that presumptions mm-hmm. that they're, like you said, that they're sexual, that they're having intimacies when that mm-hmm. may not be the case at all. Yeah. Yeah. There might be um, something so, going on there, but there may not be, it may not be what you think it is. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, like, so I've said this, you know, term a few times. So there, there is a um, philosopher by, by the name of Elizabeth Brake. So she is the one who came up with the, um, the idea of am, um, a meadow normativity, um, which is the idea that everybody needs to be in a romantic relation or there, you know, that there is a norm that everybody needs to be in a romantic relationship. And I think that the, um, the best example for that, um, have, uh, has anybody seen single all the way? Why does that, that was sound the, familiar? So that was the, um, kind of Netflix gay, a Christmas movie um, last right. season with Jennifer Coolidge and Michael Urie mm-hmm. uh, about um, the gay guy who goes home uh, to visit his family with his best friend. Um, and, you know, uh, the family is pressuring Michael Yuri to be in a relationship with his best friend. Um, and they're like, no, we're just friends. We're just friends. Well, at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, they find that, oh, we have the, these feelings towards each other. Mm-hmm. But do they? I don't know. <laughs> mm. Or did they feel pressured and they just gave in? That, like, I think <laughs> to, you know, on the surface, it was really cute and, you know, whatever. But, like, you know, you kind of wonder, you know, how much are we pressuring each other to be in relationships with people when, like, you know, I think the the goal there is just companionship. And you don't Mm -hmm. have to be fucking in order to have a companion. Right. True that. So, well, this is what I find interesting because so we kind of – I keep talking, like, an historical, like – comparison what i find interesting is uh, in the 90s late 90s into the aughts like the beginning of the 2000s i kept seeing a lot of relationships and knowing about the internet and how it was like making the world smaller i started thinking to myself uh, i was seeing couples and i was thinking i think you're couples because this is what you decided based on where you lived and who you knew and I'm not really sure of another way to phrase that without making it indelicate. Um, <laughs> it's not shade. How dare you, David? Um, I think, yes, fact. <laughs> and and here's, here's why I'm saying this. Because I noticed, like, I, I not all the time, but I kept seeing, like, as a repeat pattern of behavior that, like, they would open their relationship up and then there would be issues about, like, trust and you know, fidelity and these other things. And a part of me was like, I get it. You two have been together for like 15, 20 years, but obviously that hasn't all been worked through or determined, or maybe you have communication issues or whatever. And yet at the same time, I'm like, so both of you were same from the same, like 30 square mile area born, grew up in that area. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if there's a certain inventory of, of availability for persons to have a relationship with you may end up making decisions or they may have made those decisions simply because this is all they Mm -hmm. thought that there was Mm. and then with the internet as you you know expand in the world and you can get on apps and different platforms and websites and people thousands of miles away will be like you're hot you know and this is outside the bots um you know and you might (laughs) think to yourself like oh 
like the world really is a sea of possibilities. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I bring all this up because I, I kind of wonder now in, in this discussion that we're having, if people felt pressured by society to be in a relationship because to be alone was like one of the worst things ever. So you established yourself in a relationship because you thought it was the best thing for you, given the context, the time, the place, all of those things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. That's, I think we saw it, or at least I did a lot in like college and, and such when you're, we were in a, like I went to a small school and the, gay LGBTQ community there was even smaller. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people would, like, it, I, my favorite line from um, that 70s show was like, you switch partners more than, you know, square dancers kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I kept seeing. Like, it was, oh, I'm dating him now. No, I'm not, now I'm dating him. Or I'm dating her now. Now I'm dating her. And it was this weird, like, mix of things. It was like, well, why are you why are y'all like, like, what are y'all doing? Like, it, like it, it, you know, like, like it, it seems pretty obvious that the reason y'all are getting together has, ha, I think it has to do with the fact that you don't want to be by yourself. Instead oh, that's of, interesting. Cause I didn't think you were going that direction. Yeah. Well, I thought you. I thought you were going the direction of we're applying the label of being in a relationship because we fuck it, and oh. like, and we can't own that. Like, mm. so we call it that we're in a relationship that we're dating, but mm. we're not really dating. We're not going out. We're not necessarily sharing and doing things together with our lives, except for a DNA exchange. Do you know what I mean? I mean like, maybe <laughs> it may have also been the case too, but. Well, I was no, thinking, well, I mean, people. I, yeah. That was kind of what I saw in college. I mean, there was some people that were legitimately, I think, in relationships. That was a horribly judgmental statement. Sorry. <laughs> they were in relationships that met the, the traditional context. So there appeared to be a commitment. There appeared to be love. And there was intimacy. So, like, it was, you know, it modeled what we were told was a relationship. But then mm -hmm. there were others where I was like, you bed hopping. Like, <laughs> You say you dating, but you bet hop it. Like, I, okay, mm -hmm. label it how you want, but I don't, I don't necessarily see it that way. But anyways, so like, <laughs> sorry, it's like trying to process that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you bring up a really good point. If if we were to take away the um expectation of relation of romantic relations and romantic and sexual relationships and you could just cohabitate with whoever that you wanted to in however way you wanted to just as just as long as you were setting like you were working together towards a common goal i wonder how things would be different mm -hmm. agreed well i mean i think you can I'm thinking about people that I'm aware of that would most likely, if they found out about QPR, they would probably say that's what they have mm -hmm. because they are highly supportive of each other. They contribute to each other's lives and yet they are not romantic nor sexual. Right. So, yeah. So um, there's also, I think there's research. Um, I'd have to go look at the, um, the document, but that, uh, this really also um, – have you heard of lesbian bed death? Yes. Yeah, so lesbian bed death <laughs> is a term in, um, in you know, queer therapy that, like, after a specific amount of time, lesbian – uh, those in a lesbian relationship um, stop having sex. Um, and it's a really um, – negative term <laughs> right? okay um, right yeah it kind of sounds negative <laughs> have, having having had a few best friends that are identify self-identifying as lesbian and having that term thrown around um it, that's why i know of it i'm like i've definitely heard of it i've also i mean it's it's a negative connotation it needs a better phrasing in my opinion but i've also known it to happen in same gender male relationships yeah. That, yeah, you know, that after a certain amount of time being together, the the intimacy either shifts or changes, and it is not necessarily sexual together. 
Um, yeah, that so sounds like, like the, something the... that'd be in in heterosexual relationships too. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Like this is not something that is just for, but like this comes from like research that shows that lesbian couples in committed relationships have less sex um, than any other couple, the longer the relationship lasts. Interesting. Hmm. And generally experience less sexual intimacy as a consequence. So it's a commonality thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's old. It's from 1983. I was just going to say, like, I think that needs to be revisited, Ed, like, especially since you gave the year. I'm like, oh, that's like four decades ago. 40 years old. Almost. Because I have a feeling it it's quite often exists in all relationships, like yeah. all relationship types, I guess is what yeah. I'm trying to say. Like, if you have to put a label on it and categorize it. It doesn't matter what the genders of the participants are in those relationships. It just happens. I think there's a couple of factors. One variable is just aging. Um, yeah. You know, the body ages, it changes, and hormones change. And ergo, there could be less interest in, you know, intimacy or sexual functioning. And so, Yeah, so many factors may go into that. But so this... Um, um, so a couple things... Um, Tristan Terramino, um, who is the author of the, the book that I have referenced a bunch of times opening up, mm -hmm. um, for, for ethical non-monogamy. So, um, uh, so they stated that sex gets old regardless of couples, um, sexual orientation and, um, David Schnarch, who I've also referenced, um, who RIP, I love him, um, said that like, you know, a lot of his work are with heterosexual couples. And if you don't think that, um, that heterosexual couples grapple with this, with similar issues, you're, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, so like there is also a lesbian author by the name of Felice Newman, um, who stated that lesbian bed death is the greatest disservice that we ever did to, um, to the lesbian community because the fact, uh, cause the statistics don't vary that much. And so kind of like what we were saying that if you're gay, straight, um, long term relationships can be challenging when it comes to sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And therefore, it isn't unique to lesbian relationships, or more predominant necessarily in lesbian relationships. That's the part where I'm like, uh, I think this needs to be revisited, because I think exactly you would find what I think exists and I have no proof of this. So I'm just throwing this out there as a hypothesis and anyone who's going to pursue a PhD, you're welcome. So the, the thing is like, I think you're going to see a similar arc regardless of the gender identity and the orientation of the participants. I think the arc will be pretty similar time after time after time, especially for a longer relationship. You're going to see continually that it slopes on the, as you get closer to the end of the relationship, but it's got a length to it, you're going to see more and more, I think, a similar pattern of less sex, period. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess if I was to pursue anything, is further education, there might be something. Anyways, I'm not planning on it. Um, so what I was going to say, though, is hold on. Um... Where's the thing about lesbian bed death in this? Um, this really, this really just transforms dominant like sexual scripts um, for relationships, um, and that this can really help the um, the current research on lesbian bed death um, uh, to be something that can be normalized, not something to be vilified. Right. I agree. I think if we were honest with throughout the spectrum of of lgbt and um hetero relationships i think if people were honest with the with themselves about what was going on they would understand that this is something that can happen across the board it's not just something that is mainly lesbian centric um i i yeah right i, I just, mean i i, I kind of look at it this way like i think of my grandparents they had six kids. One mm -hmm. of the jokes in the family was, when did you have time to have kids? Because <laughs> my grandfather worked three jobs and wasn't home that often. So my dad infamously asked his mother, my grandmother, like, 
when did you all have time to have kids? And my grandmother quit back. And now you all know where my wit comes from. She said, well, if there's anything about your father, she's speaking to my dad. If there's anything about your father, it didn't take anything but once. <laughs> which, wow. was, which was her way of saying, like, like, we may not have had sex a lot, but it counted pretty much every <laughs> single time. Like, <laughs> had six kids. <laughs> You know, and we're talking the fifties here, right? Yeah. So, you know, like it where's, just, where's it, the RuPaul like shade button? Like <laughs> <laughs> But I think but I like I, I loved that like frankness of like, you know, yes, he was busy, you know, I was raising a family, he was busy working, blah 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 blah, you know, like and yet we still had time, not very often. Mm -hmm. But basically it counted every single time that it happened. And I was like and and yet, you know, like he's very fertile. <laughs> the the understanding is um that went away. Mm hmm And, you know, they haven't had kids uh for decades. And that's not mm -hmm. to say I'm not making presumptions, but I think it would be pretty fair to uh make a guess that, you know, that was happening less and less. Mm hmm. So, yeah, I would highly recommend there's a really good book out there called. Um, oh, man, I can't think of it right now by David Schnarch. Um, hold mean? on. I know, right? He just recently died. R.I.P. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think one of the things to I know you're going to think of the book, but uh, passionate I mean, marriage. OK. I'll add a link to the doc here in a second. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's That's also a, um, if you have Audible, there is a really good uh, conversation or talk that he gives. It's like a two hour um, Audible thing um, where he goes over a lot of the main points of the, of the book. Uh, and there's some really, really good uh, sound bites in there about intimacy and connection and, um, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, the thing I was, I was going to joke a little bit, but it's kind of true. We don't often think, we try not to think about, you know, our parents were, you know, sexually active. You know, we, we, I don't think we, we have that, you know, we try not to think about it because then we go, whoa, what's going on? But it had to have, have happened or else you wouldn't be here. So, right. Uh, Right. <laughs> and um I mean my parents divorced uh not too like so my sister was born in eighty two, they divorced in ninety four. And I don't recall again from then as much as I can remember, I don't remember them being as intimate or as I mean, romantic potentially, yes, but like um, intimate, either not to my knowledge or, or I blocked a lot of it out. Um, right. Or it was on the DL and they were, they were yeah. consciously aware to not, you know, have the kids around or something. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, I, I have a distinct memory about uh, now as an adult, I understand what was happening. I figured it out in my 20s because I had a memory as a small child, like, hearing noises from my parents' bedroom, I thought my father was beating up my mother. Like, I thought it was a, a domestic abuse, like, domestic violence kind of situation. I was oh. young. I was, like, uh. six. Oh. Five, maybe? Like, I had no context for understanding other than there were noises. Um, years later, in the 20s, you know, I'm in college, maybe, or post-college, and all of a sudden, the epiphany comes to me, and I have this memory. And then all of a sudden, it all falls into place. And I was like... Come, come. <laughs> right. Oh. Right. Oh. <laughs> right. I was like, oh. 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. It was being freaky. And my mother was very vocal. But I misunderstood. And I thought he was beating her up. When in fact oh, he was yeah. beating her up. But it was it was a good thing. 
Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually enjoying to get... <laughs> Yes. Um, well, to get back to like, well, so, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that uh, the other thing to, uh, the other question I want to ask though is why do people get married? What is one of the reasons people get married? Wait, tax wait. deductions. Well, I was just going to say, like, here in the U.S., uh, there's there's a whole myriad of things, but. Well, Jeff said it for there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits to being like married, you know, legally married, um, which is another reason why the whole um, a matter of normative normativity. Right. Like what if people could just get married cohabitate and like g- like have commitment ceremonies and like they don't like th- there doesn't have to be any romance or sexual nature to their relationship in order for it to be valid mm-hmm. well but it, the validity is the key issue though Ed. like look at what mm-hmm. happened in same gendered relationships for decades you know exactly um, not many states in the united states of america currently still recognize common law marriage and I don't have facts on this, but my perspective is a lot of them were taken away legally because of the fact that same gendered relationships were going to have to be recognized as legally established marriages in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. If you lived together for seven years, you were automatically in a common law marriage. All you needed was proof of cohabitation for that amount of time and that you were legally adults of age. And that became a problem when you know, queer identifying, you know, individuals wanted to have marriage because Mm -hmm. marriage is sanctimonious. Marriage is spiritual. Marriage is in a church. Marriage is la, 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 la. And so this whole separation of church and state issue started rising up about like, you know, can you have these identities? And it is messy in the U S because as we were just saying, legally, there is a definition And then there are other definitions. And that has been my biggest beef from when I was in college. My mom and I talked about this. She said she never thought in her lifetime she would see gay marriage legally exist because of this whole fracturing that, you know, houses of worship, some of them would recognize it, but the government wouldn't. Um, And government wasn't separating itself from faith. It was being, you know, merged too much or having too Mm -hmm. much like connection. Um, And that argument still goes on to this day, I feel. That, you know, people are like, well, you know, that's it's against God's will or whatever you believe in. Yada, yada, yada. yada. And I'm like, well, that's fine. But that's faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet what we did as a nation was we took houses of worship faith and allowed them to have legal authentication. Right. And by that, I mean, like you could be married in a house of worship and the person who was the overseer was the legal binding entity in the government's eyes that officiated and said, this is an actual legal relationship. Mm. So, and that's the the issue that I have is I've said for decades, I'm like, do away with the, the word marriage. When it comes to legal, don't call it a marriage, call it something else. I don't care what the hell you want to call it. Just call it something else and be done with it. And then we can totally move away and on from this argument about marriage because marriage would then be for a house of worship. And then this other definition, this other word would be for the legal stuff, for the tax purposes, for the estate, for the recognition Mm -hmm. of like medical rights, blah, 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 like all of that kind of stuff. To quote a first generation Cubs All Out host, marriage is a religious concept and has no place in being in our laws. And I think that that that's what people struggle with though, is because we, we consistently blend those. So I find it interesting that you ask the question, you're like, well, what's the purpose of marriage? And I'm like, well, I guess it depends on who you ask and mm-hmm. what their, what their viewpoint is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, like, I think that there are so many, um, there are so many barriers, uh, for people who may want to, um, find companionship with people, but like, don't want, you know, that they're not in a romantic relationship, right? Like their, their relationship trajectory isn't going down the aisle, right? So like they will never be able to um, benefit from those, um, from those benefits that people in uh, marriages, let's say, Mm -hmm. um, get. 
Yeah. Uh, so I think that you know, I uh, to legitimate to legitim- legitimatize QTPs. Yeah. Um, or QPTs. <laughs> um, you know, like. I think that this can really transform the landscape of relationships by giving people more options Mm -hmm. and possibly be happier, Mm -hmm. find more happiness in the relationships of others because there's not so many expectations. There's not so much um, drama. (laughs) Right. Like, you know, the thing you mentioned, you know, the thing Gary mentioned early on, like the whole, like when we're 40, if we're still, um, um, single when we're forty, we're gonna get you know we're gonna get to married and all that stuff. And I'm like, like, why not? Why not? Why not? Like, right? But in the context of that time from the '90s, though, it was about having sure. a, it was about having a beard, and mm-hmm. so that you would be societally accepted, right? And not so much ostracized as being a, like a hermit or a um. Mm-hmm. Oh, why did the names went out of my head? Spinster. Yes. Um, uh, like those terms of, you know, like that yeah. are, are negative connotations about being an older single individual. Right. Um, right. And I so, just, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think that was, I agree with you, Ed. Like it would be interesting to see that, you know, QPR becomes a part of this landscape that it's just, it's just there. I mean, yeah. I think of relationships of couples I know that are the same gender that have been married for decades and they are, for the most part, roommates. Like, mm-hmm. and I say that not to be, you know, judgmental or negative. I don't really have much of an impression in terms of like intimacy mm-hmm. or, and it's not that they don't have a love for each other, but I, like, a part of me wonders if like that's a natural evolution of a relationship mm-hmm. that there, there comes a point where that is not a desired need or a capacity that has to exist between the the people that are involved right. and right. you know i mean a relationship right is um is determined between two people or the peoples uh, that are a part of it right like mm-hmm. nobody else can define a relationship that's why you know um like we can sit here and say oh they're in a you know a, a queer platonic relationship right but like having giving people that option to say hey this is this is a thing right and like mm-hmm. I think that if we were to to give that to people, they'd be like, "Oh fuck, <laughs> mm-hmm. I have this right." Yeah. Like, and I wonder how much of like pressure that would, and how much shame. Like, right. think about like the shame that people feel because they're not desiring to have um, uh, sexual relations with their partner or feel any romance. Right? Like, mm-hmm. I think that this is a really radical and wonderful. Um, landscape. Yeah. Frontier. That's the better word. <laughs> well, I, what I think is interesting is I think like I'm thinking about coworkers that I have that are notably to my knowledge, single and given their age, people would start presuming or imagining things about their orientation mm. because their context is you're either gay, lesbian, or straight do you know what i mean like that like just the the main things and so if you're single then you're most likely one of the other Mm. and not straight because why would you not be in a relationship right do you understand what i'm saying like this this, concept of how you how you are defined in the world how how i compartmentalize you for my comfort is i have to label you (laughs) like Uh i have to I have to figure out a way to understand you or relate to you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the other kind of like um, last thing that I also think is really in, in interesting and important is um, so a term of endearment used among queer, platon- queer platonic partners is zucchini which I thought was really adorable because, you know, um, this research said that there isn't really that many uh, terms of endearment for people in queer platonic partners. Like usually a lot of it is, you know, romantic partners. Um, So zucchini I thought was really adorable. 
This other one, though, I found really interesting. Um, so analogous is squish and squishy to describe a non-romantic crush. So here's why I think it's interesting. How many times have you seen somebody or met somebody and you're like, oh my God, I think I have a crush on them. And you, your mind automatically goes to, I am in a room, I have a romantic crush on this person. Mm -hmm. Why does it have to be romantic? Why can't it be, I have an intellectual crush on this person? Why can't it be, I have an emotional crush on this person? Mm -hmm. Just because you, but just because you're gravitated towards somebody mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you necessarily want to be in a romantic relationship with them. Right. Like right. I call it, ooh, you just gave my brain a hard on. <laughs> nice. No, I, I get that. I've had those I've had those thoughts. Like I could really like I would love to sit down and talk with this person and learn more about them and pick their brain because what they have said or what they have done has been intriguing to me. Well, what I've learned in my life is adopting that I'm Demi, um, what has been interesting is, is that I think some of that has happened for me, that I've been intellectually turned on by somebody. And yet at the same time, there's also a physicality about the person. And what I, I didn't understand that at the time. Do you, I don't know if I'm making sense of that. Like, yeah. like there was a duality, but I wasn't understanding that there was a duality. I thought this was just the way it worked for everybody like that you could be intellectually really stimulated by a person and that turns you on in one aspect but then also physicality turns you on um and then there can also be totally separate that you can just be physically turned on by somebody and not intellectually and vice versa you can have someone intellectually turn you on and there's no physicality like it's not something about them like physically that like appeals to mm -hmm. you or turns you on. Um, yeah. But it took decades of, of having a life experience to figure that stuff out because I was, I was just presuming that like, I guess the, this is a horrible reference. The perfect package quote unquote was the two in the one. And maybe that that is what we, you know, presume as an ideal because of all the crap that we're told over the years, you know, about what is the epitome of perfectness or all that bullshit. Um, so, yeah, like, because I've there have been times where I'm like, you know, really stimulated by another person. And I and in the the time that I'm spending time with them, I'm kind of like, what's going on here? Like, I'm really kind of like drawn in and, and like making a, a really strong connection with this person. And yet at the same time, I'm like, am I interested in them? Like, like, am I getting horny? Like, what's what's happening here? And the reality is it's like, well, maybe there isn't something physical. It's just other. Mm -hmm. um, Gary, I mean, off off of this, we've had a conversation about a, a person, right, where, where I would say that that was very much my experience, where I was just like, I just want to be your friend. And I'm really, really excited about, like, the idea of, like, being your friend, right? Like, I really don't have a romantic, um, like, no, <laughs> but like the idea of being your friend, um, like makes my heart happy. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's been times like notably, I had one experience in which it got really messy for me because I was intellectually stimulated by them, but I was also physically highly aroused by them. And the fact that they were interested in me was like, it messed with me in certain ways because it took me a moment to realize that they were interested in me physically and that was like pretty much it. And and I didn't know that. And it was so it was like really difficult for me to like parse that and figure it out for a bit because I'm having I'm on a, I'm on a different level. Like I'm having two things happening at the same time. They're only having one. Yeah. And so like I'm responding with both not understanding why things don't seem to be lining up or what's going on and then I finally figure out like oh, they're not interested in me that way. They just, they, they're all about this, not this. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. yeah, they don't, they don't care. They, they really don't care. I don't yeah, care. Set that part off. Right. Yeah. Like, they just want certain skills, not a conversation. Which, by the mouth, way, so. a little less conversation, a little more action. 
<laughs> <laughs> well, and then there's like another revelation that, you know, if a person feels like, oh, not only are they only interested in me physically, they only see me as a repository. Like, you know, like, like you are just but a, a, an object. Um, and I mean, we've talked about that on the, on this podcast for years. You know, we objectify people because, you know, we find them physically attractive. We find them alluring. And and yet at the same time, you know, there there is a complexity because we're disassociating like that they're a person mm. as opposed to just, you know, a body that is stimulating or, you know, alluring or, or whatever. Uh, which is really funny and funny. Uh... Because, I mean, like, when, when you think about our relationship with, like, celebrities and everything, we develop these parasocial relationships with people, and then we get fucking pissed when they are human. Mm. Um, so, like, it's almost like we want the – we want that, but we also don't want that, right? Like, you know, we want to objectify you, um, but we also want a relationship with you. But then we find out when you are a human, we're like, oh, fuck that. Nah. Right. Oh, oh, you're that. You're messy. That's yeah. And oh, it, you, gets, oh, it gets complex. We've done episodes on that. Yeah, you. you ugh. That's frustrating we, to me. Right. We've we've talked about like the the issue of like you know putting persons on a pedestal, and then like having them fall basically because we built them up to a certain thing. We had an expectation of them. Like there were certain mm -hmm. attributes that we really appreciated, and ergo we presumed there was a lot about them, or other areas were just as like good quality or whatever and then you're you're like oh no you just bit no we don't <laughs> talk about her anymore <laughs> you're trash or mm -hmm. you know like you have you know opinions thoughts whatever behaviors that i'm not okay <laughs> oh, with oh you're you're actually a thing a person oh never mind you're a flawed <laughs> human being Ugh. oh god i don't want you anymore Right. And then you tear down the poster in your teenage bedroom and you like, you know, <laughs> have a bonfire of the vanities and write in your diary. Anyways, mm -hmm. only only people of a certain age will get that reference. That's. Yeah. So I'm disappointed to say, Ed, that right now in uh, the available uh, little emoticons that I have uh, available to me, I do not have a zucchini. I only have eggplant. <laughs> Do you have a oh? Do you have a cucumber? I do, but it's sliced. Oh, then I mean, I mean <laughs> zucchini, uh, zucchini slices. <laughs> no, I want no. everybody to have a piece of my zucchini. That doesn't sound. I mean, perverse. sharing is caring. <laughs> Anyways. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking because I was like, wait, we have eggplant. Do we have zucchini? So I went looking. I'm like, we've got a bunch of fruits and vegetables because I thought that would be nice that like you could send that to another person. What about it's a like summer a... squash? <laughs> That's not the same thing. Yes, it is. I mean, damn it. Kind of. it's, in, it's in the same family. I don't think it's a, but it's not an, an emoji though. Like, well, somebody, where's Apple? Somebody <laughs> Apples, pears, get them on peaches, top of that. We need lemons. a we need a zucchini. We need to represent Wait, for of... the for the for the queer platonic community. We got tomato, so now... zucchini, avocado, broccoli. Okay, so all uh, developers, uh, major developers, now need to have a department uh, about the uh, <laughs> current <laughs> nature of of the of relationships, so that they can make proper uh, emojis, such as having a zucchini emoji. I mean, what yes. would happen if they took the eggplant one and just turned it green? I think it would be like it would it would look like a weird zucchini. If they took right? out the curve. Yeah, then do that. Do that. Whoever's out there who wants to develop that. <laughs> um, oh, apparently is there is a zucchini emoji. What is that? That is zucchini emoji <laughs> squash okay. isolated. Oh, I'm looking at the yeah, one on the left, not on the right. No, that is, on the right. It needs to be green. It is green. The one on the right. I think. You know what? Like, I'm not here to whatever, but I would, I would like it to be a pickle. Girl. 
the pickles. I have uh, my, pickle I is have like my, it just uh, pickled cucumber. I have my rationale, but that's for another. I just realized that there's a salad emoji. So my question is, if I send that to somebody, what goes with it to explain that I want my salad tossed? Peach. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And then Which when they fair. say, you want a peach salad? No. No. I want you want. to peach my salad. <laughs> peach my salad. <laughs> uh, salad my peach, Jeff. Uh, and this is where we lost the audience. They're like, they've re- they, the host of derailed and the guest. Anyways. Which is probably a good point for us to wrap yeah, up. Okay. Was there any other stuff we should discuss about this ad you wanted to, to cover for folks? No, I think... Um, uh, no, but I, I do think that possibly it would be a good topic um, for future, maybe talk about asexual relationships, aromantic. Um, I think that that would be um, a good topic. I think it might be. So are you saying for for landscape of relationships? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, I don't know what you were um hoping to talk to Cody about uh well basically that but I mean one of the things is that he does have a spoiler alert he has a book coming out um yeah and it's currently available for pre-order um I think it comes out in January of next year if I remember correctly so um but yeah we could look at that seeing how we could line that up and um I was just thinking like before he comes on I might send him link to this episode and be like, hey, check this out. Hey, check this out. Yeah, it can also be, um, yeah, no, I think that maybe even before that, it would be really cool to maybe do some, um, because, you know, I mean, what does it mean to be asexual in a relationship? What does it mean to be, mean to be a romantic in a relationship, right? Um, Okay, so I just figured out you're on the right track. I just want to do it for mm-hmm. you. There you go. Um, <laughs> no, because I just realized, like, I was approaching Cody because I was thinking it would be part of our LTAS series. Mm. As talking about, like, sex and sexuality, that this is a part of the, the you know, spectrum or continuum of sexuality. And I think you're right to talk about, like, asexuality and aromanticism, like, in terms of relationships, which are different dynamics. And what does it mean to be in a allo ace relationship? Mm-hmm. 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 So yeah, we can definitely put that in the books. Okay. Right here first. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. I think we have another topic. <gasps> Yay. Oh. Nice thing is. Uh, we have a nice full playlist of all of our landscape relationship series. So, hey, if you need to reference something, take a look at it over on YouTube. It's at uh, Cubs Out Loud. Just YouTube.com slash Cubs Out Loud. But that's skipping ahead because I think this is the end of the show. We got some links in our show notes, so which you can find all over at uh, CubsOutLoud.com where you can leave a comment on the blog. Uh, if you have some more comments, you can shoot us an email at cubsoutloud at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 361-COL-TALK. Uh, also, I think I still need somebody to, to call it, text it, or something to keep it. You can, also, you can also leave us a message on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube at Cubs Out Loud, the appropriate place of the URL. Or you can join our entourage chat at tinyworld.com slash telegram dash col. Uh, if you would like to see when we're planning on recording these shows, you can check out our Google Calendar at tinyworld.com slash calendar dash col. You can get various accoutrements, such as a Cubs Out Loud Consent is My Foreplay shirt in many different styles, or a logo shirt, or a handy towel. Mm-hmm. Or mug, or uh, various other things. You can get all that at zazzlezazzle.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Some of these designs, including the original this design, uh, was designed by Smashy. You can find more of his work at tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud, or if you want to send us a donation, you can do that at paypal.me slash Cubs Out Loud. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Audible, and many other platforms. 
um, where you get your podcasts. Uh, please rate and review us there. The more people who read us and review us, the uh, better the algorithm shares the show with other people. And if you want to find me anywhere in the internet, you can find me at box at box, puppy box, cut box, something or other, and Windjum, W Y N D G E M, on Twitch, where we stream Bears and Dragons, which has turned into a bi weekly series, by the way, every other week. Uh, another one coming up this week. Damon? If we get in touch with me, you can find me as Theater Cub 79. That's T H E A T R E C U B 79 on most bear related sites or on Facebook. Or you can find me as pup underscore umbra on Twitter. The Twitter is definitely not safe for work. Gary. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GearBear73. My Twitter that is definitely not safe for work is GearBear73XXX, although it is mostly everybody else but me because I'm shy like that. Oh. That being said, uh, before oh. we forget, if you uh, were not aware and you would like to join us this coming Saturday, August 27th, for most of the world, depending on your time zone, is a recording and uh, fun of episode 662, which is Jeff's Decade of Delirious Birthdays. <laughs> Yay! Because the producer's having a birthday. So uh, we're going to uh, have a little show. Um, but it's going to be over on the Google Meet platform, and we're going to play some games. Uh, we've got a posting up. If you are interested and you aren't already aware, if you go to tinyurl.com backslash calendar hyphen col, you can see the calendar. There's an invite on there um, with all the information. And so, yeah, uh, we are moving away from the power hours that we've done in the past. So it will not be 60 shots over 60 minutes. Um, not. Right. Our livers very much appreciate that so <laughs> also inflation <laughs> <laughs> well it just you know we're getting older and mm -hmm. you know all our audience is welcome to come and participate you can bring a snack and beverage of choice uh, and participate or watch in the silliness we'll have some uh, kind of fun along those lines but uh, to check that information out of course as well so in and, the ripe old age of the uh, answer to the ultimate question of life the universe and everything yeah. It's true. So, Ed, if people want to get in touch with you, how would they do so? Um, well, you can find me on uh, Facebook as Edward AC. Um, you can find me on uh, Instagram as um, doc, dr. Um, period un unicub underscore sex brain wizard. Um, you can find me on TikTok as Dr. Unicub79. Uh, um, you can find me on uh, Twitter as Eddie H. Cook. And then uh, for some not safe for work stuff, that is Jeep Daddy 3. Um, but just send me a request first because if I know you or, you know, you're like a client or family, <laughs> you don't need to see all that. No, you don't need to see all that shit. No. Yeah. We don't need to get in that. And with that, say good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye. Ciao for now.